Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, I am pleased that we have Dr. Jamie Turndorf, who is known to millions as Dr. Love, through her syndicated radio show called Ask Dr. Love, and the website AskDrLove.com, which is actually the first relationship advice website since 1995. She has authored several books on resolving relationship conflicts with partners, friends, family members, and children. She is the go-to relationship expert on numerous networks such as CBS, VH1, WebMD, and MSNBC. Most recently, CNN has been featuring her as the resident authority on relationship advice and human behavior. So, what does Dr. Love know about life after death? Well, she hosts the number one show on Hay House Radio called Love Never Dies, based on her number one international best-selling book called Love Never Dies, How to Reconnect and Make Peace with the Deceased. This book has been translated into 34 languages and is being made into a feature film. And you can find out more about her at AskDrLove.com, or I have all the links to her website, radio show, books, and more at WeDon'tDieRadio.com and click on episode 120. So without further ado, Dr. Jamie Turndorf, or should I say, Dr. Love, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. No, I almost died and kicked the bucket from that introduction there. You know? <laughs> Except we don't die, so I'm just speaking to you from the spirit realm now. You're so funny and you're so great, and I'm so pleased that you said yes to coming on the show. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to be with you. Yeah, and you're my neighbor not too, too far away. We're only a few states between New York yeah. and Massachusetts. so That is very true. We're in the same time zone. Very true. Yeah. Except there, but there's no time either. So okay, I'm not going to go. All right, there. but where do we start? Where you've been on zillions of interviews, I know. But could you just tell us a little bit about your story and yeah, yeah, and we just so, talk. Go ahead. I would love to. So you know, as I tell you about my story, I'm really taking you on the Love Never Dies journey yes. along with me because the Love Never Dies book is in three parts, and the first part is my story. So I'll just tell you and everybody listening a little bit so you get an idea of my love story for the ages and how our story will help you. So when I was a young girl, Sandra, I had a detailed premonition of the man I was going to marry. I saw his face. I saw his body. And so I said to myself, I'm not going to date. I'm going to wait till this guy appears. A very medieval concept, you know, (laughs) for some growing up in the 70s. So I did wait and he did appear on the first day of my freshman year at Vassar College. I had been shut out of all intro sociology classes and I really wanted to take sociology. So I asked the secretary of the of the department, Judy Cadwallader, what can I do? She said, go ask the chair uh, of the department, a man named Jean Pin, if he can find a seat for you in one of the closed classes. Well, Sandra, the minute I stepped into that man's office, I had the first and only out-of-body experience of my life. I literally felt my soul shooting at high speed through a tunnel to the end of my life. And when I shot back into my body, I received the message, remember every aspect of this meeting, he's going to be everything to you one day. Wow. And then I forgot all about it and went about my life as a college student. Now, I found out right after meeting Jean, that for most of his life, he had been one of the most famous Jesuit priests in history. He had taught at the Vatican, and he founded a movement called Liberation Theology, designed to fight church oppression from within. And he actually launched to international fame when he publicly opposed the Pope and the Catholic Church as they were trying to block the legalization of divorce in Italy. He told Mm -hmm. me years 
Yeah, he was a radical feminist Jesuit priest. He didn't want to see women trapped in marriages where they were being abused. So he fought on the grounds of liberation theology. The church should butt out of the private sector. He won. He got the divorce bill passed and changed the course of Italian history. And soon after, the Pope granted him the dispensation of his vows so that he wouldn't be excommunicated. And he was recruited by Vassar College, where he had been serving as the chair of the Department of Sociology for uh, about four years on the day that I met him. Now, I have to tell everybody, because this figures greatly in the story. My background was totally different from Jean's. I was raised by two devoutly atheist Jewish parents. <laughs> the only religion my parents taught me was religiously hating each other. Hmm. That's the only religion they practiced, hate. And they taught me not to believe in God or the afterlife. Wow. And I never discussed religion. I never went to church, none of that. And I never discussed religion with Jean, at least not when he lived in a body. Okay, so now in my senior year at Vassar, I needed help with the statistical portion of my thesis. And I had heard that, among other things, Jean had been a famous statistician, having founded the Vatican's first and only social research center. So even though he wasn't my advisor, I asked him if he would help me with my statistics. He cheerfully gave me his time. And within a couple of weeks, we just knew. We were crazy for each other. Mm, nice. we, we were twins separated at birth, just, so, just soulmates. From that moment on, for 27 years, we were inseparable. We wrote books together, restored houses together. We just rejoiced in every moment we spent together. Now, in the last year of his bodily life, we started getting premonitions separately that he was going to die of an accident. We just didn't know when or where. We went to Italy on our final summer vacation. And one day while we were sitting on the beach, Jean's hand was up over his head as if to block the rays of the sun. Suddenly, a bee swoops down and stings his left hand at the exact location of Christ's stigmata. And now, Sandra, I watch my beloved suffocate to death in front of my eyes. Oh my gosh. I can't even describe, I mean, I try in part one of Love Never Dies to describe the agony of having him ripped from me in this way. I go back to the hotel room. I collapse on the bed. I'm shaking. I'm trembi trembling. I'm crying hysterically. And the next thing I know, I feel that man's hand stroke the entire length of my spine. <laughs> I, I pop bolt upright. I look over, over my shoulder I know what I felt. I didn't see him, but I knew he was there. And he has been with me ever since that moment. And his astonishing manifestations to this day, often in front of witnesses, have proven to me we don't die. We just leave our bodies. And therefore, our relationships aren't meant to end with bodily death. And so I have created my groundbreaking new trans-dimensional grief therapy method that totally diverges from the Western approach, which is grieve, let go, move on, do it in six months, or else we're going to give you psychiatric labels and drugs. It's an abomination. Instead, I show you how to say hello, not goodbye, and how to do it without a medium, a channeler, or a psychic. And then there's just one more piece, because as a shrink, I know millions of people harbor unfinished business with those in spirit. And again, Western grief therapy gives us no way of working it out. So my new transdimensional grief method and my dialoguing with the departed technique shows you not only how to reconnect, but also how to dialogue back and forth to heal your unfinished business. Mm, very good stuff. And I want to hear more about it. But if I don't if you don't mind going back just a little sure um, you said um you felt his hand brush your back and there yeah. were other things would you i'd love to just tell us <laughs> I, some I, stories i'd love to i know for myself stories is what really makes oh, a difference that this is all to. real and that, yeah. now i believe and uh, and you know every week on the hay house radio show that's tuesdays at noon i tell the latest stories because there are new stories every week but i'll just sh share a few now okay and just to give everybody an idea so so after after that night that i felt his hand i came back 
from Italy. And I spent the first night alone in my bed and I heard Jean quoting something to me. I had no idea what it was. Now just make a mental bookmark because I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes because okay. it's important. But in the meanwhile, I, I come down to the kitchen the next morning having not slept and I hear Jean speaking to me through what I came to learn is called mind melding or thought induction. He just put a thought in my mind and he said, open the back door. I want to show you something. Hmm. I open the door and sitting right on the stoop is a chipmunk. And the chipmunk is obviously in an altered state. The chipmunk's not moving. Normally you'd open the door. It would run away. He's frozen stiff. His eyes are almost closed and he's sitting with me. And the next thing I know, I watch that chipmunk begin to mimic my husband's bodily departure. He starts to choke and gasp and retch, and he's ripping at his little face with his two hands, mimicking the way my husband was ripping at the oxygen mask because the air wasn't getting in and he was suffocating. And of course, tears are pouring down my face as I watch this poor chipmunk going through this agony. And for 20 minutes, he does this. And after 20 minutes, I see him visibly cough up a wonk of mucus and he's fine. And even in my befuddled state, I knew my husband was using this little creature as his open vessel. That's the term that I've come to coin to describe the way our loved ones in spirit communicate with us through human and animals who are natural open vessels mm, to speak communication, speak messages from our loved ones in spirit. Now, the next thing that happened that was extraordinary was... I had to fax Jean's death certificate to Verizon, our phone carrier. Mm -hmm. And I had sent many multi-page faxes throughout the day, no problem. But when it came time to fax his death certificate to Verizon, the cover letter faxed without a hitch, but then the death certificate hung up. So then I tried with the obit. Again, cover letter faxes without a hitch, the obit hangs up. I tried 20 times, I finally give up. The next day, I go to my lawyer's office and I say, listen, I don't tell them why. Would you just do me a favor, please, and mail uh, and fax this for me to Verizon? I'm waiting and waiting, Sandra, waiting and waiting. Finally, all the secretaries come out of the back office and they say to me, they're weeping. Jamie, we tried 20 times. The cover letter faxes without a hitch, but the obit and the death certificate will not fax. He's trying to tell you that he's not gone. Wow. So, I know. So now I go home and again, I have to fax his death certificate somewhere else. And again, he hangs it up after the cover letter goes. So I say to him, listen, I think you're doing this because I keep forgetting that you're still here with me. If I promise to try to remember, will you let this freaking fax go through <laughs> in its entirety? I cancel the fax and I feel a tidal wave of love pouring into me. And I know that that was Jean's acknowledgement. I heard you okay. I reissue the facts and it goes through in its entirety. So by this point, I'm starting to realize things are getting pretty wild in my life. Strangers are starting to walk up to me. They don't know me at all, don't know my story. And they just say, your husband says, tell our story. And then they walk on. Wow. Now I know. Now around this time, I'm driving. And I feel the need for the first time in my life to pray to Jean on behalf of someone else. Now, this is wild for an atheist girl to pray at all. I'd never prayed. So I pray to him for my friend, Emily. They don't know each other, never even saw photos of each other. And I just said, would you please help my friend, Emily, find love? With that, I feel that tidal wave of love pour inside me again. I look at the dashboard of my clock on my, my, my car, and it shows me the time is 4.58. I make note of it. That night, I get a phone call from Emily. She says, Jamie, I have to tell you what happened today. I said, what happened, Emily? She said, at 4.58, my cell phone rang. She said, at that moment, I fell into a trance and your husband appeared to me. No kidding. Oh, my she, gosh. She describes him to a T. And she said, he told me to find love. Follow the gray stones to the church in your neighborhood. Well, my gosh, by reiterating the words of my prayer, mm 
He was validating his presence. He heard what I asked for. And he was also bringing a blessing to her by telling her, you know, the church is your answer. A week later, she comes to my professional group in the city and she tells this story. Now, at this point, another member of the group, a former seminarian named Mitch Wood, said to her, what's the name of the church that Jean sent you to? She says, oh, the Claremont Church. Mitch gasps. He says, the Claremont Church, that's New York City's only liberation theology seminary. Well, remember I said Jean founded liberation theology? Yeah. Put his stamp in yet another way on that manifestation. Now, I'm going to give one more example. Okay. And, And this involves what I call earthly props. These are electronic devices that our loved ones in spirit will often use to signal their presence and communicate with us because they're pure energy. It's easier for them to work with these electronic devices. And this example involves the phone. So it was early in my bereavement and I was lying on the floor of my closet crying. It was a hobby in the early days. I did a lot of it. So, of course. uh, um, Right. So I am sitting on the floor and I'm thinking, you know, I have to speak to my friend, Anne. No, don't bother her. It's her work day. After 20 minutes of this mental hemming and hawing, in the distance, I hear the phone ring. I pull myself up. I go to the phone and it's Anne. She says, Jamie, did you call? I said, no, Anne, but I was thinking I have to talk to you. So we were flabbergasted when she said, Jamie, my phone rang and your name and number appeared on the caller ID. John literally manipulated the electronics to call her on my behalf because he knew I needed to talk to her. Now, a little while later, I had a chest cough and I'm thinking I am going to suffocate the way Jean did. And I say to him out loud, Jean, if you're with me right now, please, please do that caller ID phone trick. Do it right now. Call my housekeeper, Donna, and have my name and number appear on her caller ID. Sandra, two seconds later, my phone rings. It's Donna. She says to me, did you just call? I said, no, Donna. But I told her that I asked y'all to call her. And she says, well, my phone rang and your name and number appeared on the caller ID. Oh, my gosh. No. So now around this time, I'm a member of a writer's group. And I'm telling all the stories of Jean's manifestations. Mm -hmm. And the head of the group, Gabe Davis, a devout Jewish atheist, says, you know, I'd like to see that caller ID phone trick repeated. And this time I'd like to see whether your phone call log shows a record of having been manipulated to dial out to the other person, even though you didn't use the phone. I I forget the challenge. It's a month later and I'm driving behind Gabe and his wife, Robin, to meet them for dinner. When all of a sudden I feel that tidal wave of love again and I know it's Jean and I look at the clock on the dashboard and I see... 545. I get to the restaurant a few minutes later and I open the door and Gabe is already stampeding me. He says, Jamie, you won't believe what happened. I said, what happened, Gabe? He said at 545, my cell phone rang. He said, I looked at the caller ID. Your name and number appeared. He said, I picked up the call and a man's voice said, is Jamie there? Mm. Is ja- is Jamie there? He said the voice had an accent and it prolonged the word, the syllable there. And I, well, Jean was French and he did prolong that syllable. It sounded like there. Uh, he said it wasn't a real call. The voice just faded away. The call never clicked off. He said, go get your phone and see if it dialed me. Well, I hadn't used the phone all day. I dig to the bottom of my purse, pull it out. Sure enough, 545. My phone dialed Gabe. So what is the point of all these over-the-top manifestations? Because remember, Jean said to me, tell our story. Mm -hmm. So these manifestations are for you and for everybody listening. Because he said to me right after he left his body, Jamie, let our love shine like a torch that lights the path for others. So our story is meant to let you and everybody listening know your loved ones are here with you too. They're just waiting for you to learn how to open the door of your heart and let them back in, which is what I do now in part two of Love Never Dies. 
Let's hear it, sister. This is amazing. You've given me goosebumps lots of times. Oh, uh, yay! And yay. I know because you know I I have not had a spouse or intimate partner die, but I've had close my dad and close relatives, and the pain of grief is devastating. And I know, I know it just because I know what I know of you that there's other ways around and traditional grieving and what people say so i want to tie this in and hear part two of and then where part we go three, to next right exactly. where i show you how to do it yourself okay yeah. so part two we have to overcome the false beliefs and the false religious teachings that block most people from reconnecting. And then in part two of part two of Love Never Dies, I go into a little bit of the science where I explain to you how this all happens. And, you know, a lot of people need to understand that. So yeah. in a nutshell, okay, the first obstacle we have to overcome is the wrong belief that we're not supposed to stay in connection with our loved ones in spirit. Now, remember I said a few minutes ago that Jean spoke to me on the first night that I was back from Italy and he was quoting something. Yes. So I'm going to I'm going to return to this now. Okay. So when I heard him quoting something to me that I didn't recognize, the next day I went to his priest to prepare the readings for Jean's funeral. And I said to the priest, look, he's been quoting something to me. I have no idea what it is. Now, the priest at this moment raises his brow in obvious skepticism, like, you know, this bitch has rounded the bend. You know, she's <laughs> lost her mark. Right? So, but then when I told him what Jean was saying, the priest goes white. He crosses himself and he says, dear God, Jamie, at first I didn't believe that Jean was speaking to you, but I do now. And then he tells me, you are quoting an obscure biblical passage from the communion of saints. Like I would have known, as I said, I never read the Bible. I never went to church or synagogue. Right. Jean and I did not discuss religion. So now it took me a year, Sandra, it took me a year to understand why Jean chose to quote that and only that passage to me. Because remember, he was a religious pioneer in life and he continues to be in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And what I found out is the communion of saints says that our loved ones in spirit are one with or in communion with God and the saints. And so this means that because we're supposed to stay in communion and communication with God and the saints, it means the Bible is telling us we're also supposed to stay in communion and communication with our loved ones in spirit because they are one with God and the saints. Great news. Great so the news. point, it's huge. So for everybody who's been raised a Christian or a Catholic, mm -hmm. you, my husband who's a religious pioneer, is telling us, hey, we've been overlooking one of the greatest truths in the Bible. His point to us is what we've been told about the afterlife is dead wrong, if you'll pardon my pun. <laughs> <laughs> We're not supposed to live in an emotional wasteland separated from those we love, waiting until we quote unquote die and enter heaven. Because as Jean told me, Soon after he left his body, Jamie, heaven is a state, not a place. Heaven is all around us. Heaven is here and now. So this means we're supposed to reconnect with our loved ones in spirit now. Mm, okay? Great. So that's a huge one. Now, another, uh, you know, I, I just recently uh, put online my Love Never Dies online course. You can find it at loveneverdiesonlinecourse.com. But in that, I talk about all these misconceptions, which obviously we don't have time to go into everything, right? But, you know, I'll just give you a couple. Sure. You know, one of them is, oh, well, you can't move on with your life if you reconnect with your loved one, especially a spouse or a life partner. Well, this is untrue because here's the thing. When we marinate in misery, we don't move on with our lives. We're stuck in our grief. And as I show people to do, in Love Never Dies, I show you how to transform your grief to joy. As your joy lifts your grief, you're able to fully enter your life because you're not so marinating in misery. Now, another one that people will say is, well, how can you love another person if you're still connected to your spouse? Well, this would be like saying to your a woman who has a child, do you love your first child? Of course. Well, you can't have any more. Because you can only love one. Well, right. our hearts are made to love. We have room to love everybody who walks the earth plane, everybody who walks in the spirit plane. Now, here's another big misconception. Oh, well, you're going to prevent them from moving on or moving into the light. You're holding them back in some way from performing their holy work. Well, this is a bunch of garbage, too, because one of the first things I heard from Jean, and I hear it again and again from my callers and my patients, loved ones in spirit, they'll say, what else is there for me to do? It's my full-time occupation to love you. That's all I'm here to do. Oh. 
So They're sweet. here to help us hold our hands as we travel down the bumpy road called life, help us fulfill our spiritual destinies. That's what they're here for. Hmm. Now, that's their job. Now, another biggie is, oh, well, you're opening the door to the devil. I love that one. Yep, I've heard that a lot. Okay, yep. so number one, Jean, the Dalai Lama said that he was one of the 50 men of all time who was one with God. This man never mentioned the devil, dark forces, or evil because it doesn't exist. It doesn't even exist. It's just a manufactured, imagined element that is really a projection of our own dark forces. So we think the boogeyman's going to get us when it's really our own guilt over our own dark energy, and we think we're going to be punished. I go into all of this in the Love Never Dies online course, and I explain how to get past this false belief. But the thing is, even if there are lower level functioning spirits, our loved ones in spirit are our gatekeepers. They protect us from any lower level beings or whatever it is. But, you know, and we all have a built in what I call internal call blocking. If you don't <laughs> want to take the call, don't take the call. Right. Here, okay. Now, and there are many, many others that I go into in, in the Love Never Dies book and the online course. So now the part two of part two of Love Never Dies is how does spirit communication happen? We've gotten rid of our false beliefs. Now we need to understand how it happens. Now, what this comes down to, to really demystify this is it's energy. As Einstein said way back when, energy cannot be destroyed. When we leave our bodies, the energies of our soul remain. And so communicating with spirits is nothing more than the sending and receiving of energetic signals. Simple as that. And we are all born with the innate ability to energetically communicate. We do it every day. We just don't think about it. You know, you park at a light in your car. You look over at the driver in the neighboring car. The driver always looks back, right? Because uh -huh. he senses the energetic frequency of your gaze. How do twins know when the other's in trouble, even though they live on opposite ends of the world? energy. How do close couples know what the other is thinking? Again, energetic communication. So what we're talking about here is learning to send and receive energetic communications. Now, here's the second piece of science that figures into this topic. The latest understanding from the quantum physicists is that 95% of our universe is comprised of dark matter or dark energy. And because simply dark matter or dark energy cannot reflect light. So what we understand now is that the 95% of our universe that we never knew what goes on in there, that's where our loved ones reside, which fits with Jean's statement, Jamie, death's an illusion. There's a very thin veil between the realm where you are and the, real, and the realm where I am. The veil is thinner than you can ever imagine. I'm standing right here. They're in the dark matter. Yes. Right. And yeah. so learning how to communicate with them is simply sending and receiving energetic communications to and from the dark matter. Now, a lot of us don't do this because we've been told if we're Catholic or Christian, we've been told, well, you you can't reconnect with them. You know, one of the things I hear a lot is uh, they'll say, OK, look, maybe they'll communicate with you for a brief time. But once they're in heaven, you're not going to hear from them anymore. Jean's priest told me this when I went back to tell him about all the ongoing communications. And he said, look, when he's in heaven, forget it. What? There are no cell towers in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. That's our, funny. Our, our signals can't reach the, you know, heaven. Our, our human conceptions are dead wrong. So this was bothering me the whole day. I come back to my office. Jean obviously knew it was bothering me. I make the circle from the group that I'm running that evening. Everybody is late except Ashley, who's a new patient. I close the door to the group room when suddenly I hear ding, ding, which is the sound that my front door chime makes when the burglar alarm registers the door has opened. Now we hear footsteps and they stop in the adjacent waiting room. At this point, I say to her, somebody must have gotten his time wrong and Thinks it's an individual session, not a group. Now we hear the footsteps going in the opposite direction. Bang, bang, bang. Ding, ding. The door opens again. I said, wait, I got to go talk to this person. Well, get, get this, Sandra. In the two seconds that it would have taken me to go from the front door to open the door, there is no way that the person could have walked down my super long driveway, gotten to his parked car where the parking area is very far away, and driven off without my having seen him. Mm -hmm. So I take the two steps to get to the front door, open the front door, there's nobody there. So 
I come back and I say to Ashley, there was nobody there. She said, it was a spirit. <laughs> so that was Jean's way to answer the priest's comment. Oh, once I'm in heaven, you won't hear from me anymore. Did you hear those footsteps? That's right. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So now we come to part three of Love Never Dies, how to establish your own connection with your loved ones without a medium, without a channeler, without a psychic, because we are all born with the innate ability to communicate with spirit. And in it, all you have to do is learn how to tune to what I call the spirit channel of your brain. Okay. This sounds and good. That, really good. Because I know and it, it's just we all have we the ability. Want this. We just haven't developed our psychic muscles for okay. doing it. So I just break it down very simply in the first chapter in part three of Love Never Dies. I call it how to create a state of receptivity. Well, one of the first things Jean said to me was, Jamie, the noise of the day drowns me out. Anytime you want to hear me, come to the bed and be still and quiet. Now, afterwards, I found out that the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. But I didn't know that. Jean told me that. So he showed me the ways to open myself up to him. And one of the things that I show you in this third part of Love Never Dies is how to create pockets of peace. Moments where you sit in silence, you turn off the TV, you turn off the music, you turn off your cell phone. And I'm not saying you have to convert your condo into a convent. <laughs> you just need little pockets of peace, right? Mm -hmm. Then I show you how to find the right peaceful practice for yourself, yoga, tai chi, qi gong. Then I give you some breathing exercises because as Jean showed me, spirit is born on the breath and we can literally use our breath to bring our loved ones into us. In addition, I show you how to not, not let your emotional states wash you overboard, especially in the early days of grieving. We are washed overboard. And the sad fact is when we are too upset, our emotional distress acts, acts like an atmospheric storm. You know the way storms block the sending and receiving of radio or TV signals? Yes. Well, our emotional storms do the same thing. Imagine you're driving in a tunnel and you've received a telephone call, but you don't know it because you're in a dark tunnel. Then you come out of the tunnel. Whoa, I got a call when I was in the tunnel. Well, when we're, when we're in the dark tunnel of grief, same thing happens. We don't know that we're receiving messages and communications from our loved ones in spirit. So in this chapter in Love Never Dies, I show you how to titrate your emotions so that they don't wash you overboard so that then you can't receive and send communications when you desperately need to. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then I show you how to use what we call hypnagogic or twilight states. That's the state right when you wake up and right before you go to sleep where we're more open to the superconscious or trance state of the brain. And then I show you also how to use nature to reconnect because nature helps us to enter the now, which is where spirit lives. So the more we're in the now, the easier it's going to be for us to send and receive communications. And then last but not least, I give you five sensory exercises to open up all your senses because remember spirit beings are pure energy so they're able to energetically send signals and communications to all your senses so the more your sensory receivers are turned on the easier it's going to be for you to perceive the signs that are being sent to you all the time I okay like that yeah right now, speaking of signs, this segues into the next chapter in part three of Love Never Dies, recognizing the signs. And I can't tell you, Sandra, how many times I get calls from people. Oh, you're really pissing me off. Uh, I don't get signs like you do. I don't get communications like you do. I'm jealous. And invariably, they call me back after having read Love Never Dies and they say, oops, <laughs> I got all the signs. I just wasn't noticing them. So for many people, just becoming aware of the signs of spirit presence is enough to enable them to begin their reconnection. Because again, freed from the human vessel, p spirit beings are pure energy. So they're able to influence the material world in infinite ways. Signs include sounds, animals behaving oddly like the chipmunk I told you about, strange sensations, drafts, temperature changes, chills, goose flesh, symbolic communications, butterflies, rainbows. They also love to manifest coins that were minted on a year that was significant for you. Mm -hmm. Here's a great example of this. Yes. It was this past year and a patient named Kyla came into my office and I said, you know, Jean is dropping coins on me all over the place. They, and this is the anniversary week of his bodily departure. He especially drops coins that were minted the year he left his body. She blinks. She says to me, Jamie, I almost forgot. 
look at my cowboy boots. She said they were off my feet while I was in my bedroom and a coin appeared out of thin air and dropped in my boot and I got the message it was for you. <laughs> she said, I forgot to take it out. Let me give it to you now. She hands it to me and as she's handing it to me, I hear Jean saying, you'll see it was minted the year I left my body and sure enough, Sandra, it was. Okay, so now here's where, if you think what I've been saying so far is wild, get ready. <laughs> because here's, here's where love never dies. Take spirit communication to an entirely new plane. The CEO of Hay House said, we've never seen anything like what you do next, which is saying something since Hay House is the woo-woo publisher. So right, right. <laughs> they've seen it all, right? Yeah. So now I show you how you can dialogue back and forth with the departed to reconnect, to obtain guidance, and even to heal unfinished business and make peace. So I want to show you how spirits dialogue with us and how we can dialogue with them in addition to the way that they communicate with us through dreams and mind melding. They can also communicate with us using signs. Now, signs are a static form of communication in which they drop a sign on us. And we observe the sign like they drop a coin. But we can also engage in a back and forth communication between us and spirit with the help of the signs, with the help of the human and animal open vessels, with the help of the earthly props, the electronic devices and so on. So I want to give you an example. Yes, please. Of the, of the difference between how they communicate by dropping a static sign versus how we can communicate back and forth with the help of signs and earthly props and open vessels. So I, and I'm going to give you a couple of example so that I really drive the point home. Okay. So it was last year, the anniversary week of Jean's bodily departure. And I went to my chiropractor and Teresa, the secretary and I were alone in the office. And I say to her, you know, this is the anniversary week and I'm getting a lot of signs from Jean. Suddenly I smell gardenias. I don't say a word. And she says to me, Jamie, do you smell gardenias? Wow. Now, I said, Teresa, that's the scent of sanctity. Jean is giving us both a sign that he's here. Okay? There's a static sign. He dropped it on both of us. Okay? Later that day, I come home, and I see a patient named Regina who needs to reconnect with her sister in spirit. I tell her the story about the scent of sanctity and smelling gardenias. At that moment, I hear Jean speak to me, and he says to me, but I wish I could give you a bouquet of roses. Now, Jean was dialoguing with me by inducing that thought in my mind. With that, Sandra, the patient abruptly sits up and she says, Jamie, do you smell roses? Hmm. Now, in that amazing manifestation, he put the thought and the scent of roses in her mind to facilitate a back and forth dialogue between him and me. He used her to let me know I had heard him speaking to me accurately when he said, I want to give you roses. And of course, it bolstered her confidence in her ability to hear spirit. OK, mm -hmm. now I want to give another example. And this one kind of pulls out a lot of the bells and whistles, and it shows um how they can speak with us using human open vessels and earthly props, okay? Now, I did the Coast to Coast radio show last year, and Love Never Dies became an overnight bestseller. It sold out on Amazon. Mm -hmm. The next day, I get a call from a guy named, I'm not going to say his name. Anyway, he says to me, I have to talk to you. Your husband is burning up my brain with messages for you. So Wild. I'm okay. okay. Sean, communicating with me through this human open vessel. I get on the phone with the dude and he starts saying things to me in French and in Italian. Now I know that this is Jean because he's, this guy's saying things that were personal things Jean used to say to me in French and Italian. And the guy says to me, but Jamie, I'm a hillbilly. I don't know no Italian. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Italian no less, right? Uh -huh. I think, dude, I believe you, your accent really sucks. Okay. Now a couple of days later, the guy calls me back. It's Valentine's Day. He says, Jamie, I have to tell you what happened to me this morning. He said, I'm sitting with my computer on. My hands are in my lap. When I hear Jean saying to me, send Jamie a photo of the peach colored rose. The guy says that Jean takes over his computer and on it appears a photo of a peach colored rose. Okay. Now, nobody in the world knows that not only did Jean give me roses every week, they were peach colored. Aww. Okay. Amazing. And he mm -hmm. puts this peach colored rose on the guy's computer. Now, 
I have an amazing manifestation captured on film. If you go to loveneverdiesretreat.com, you will see this is where I do uh, the live four-hour retreats and people also attend virtually. You'll see Jean took my computer over and he literally, you'll see the cursor moving all by itself when nobody is near it and he posts the Eiffel Tower photo. I tell the story in the book, but just go. You won't believe it. You have that recorded Yes, I have. This is the crazy thing. Jean's manifestations, I've got them all over the YouTube. He turns lights on and off. I've captured it on camera. You go to Love to Die's retreat. You'll see him taking over my computer. And of course, I I swear because I'm so shocked. (laughs) Anyway, so the point is, here's the thing. You can dialogue. You can dialogue using human and animal open vessels. You can dialogue using uh, earthly props, machines, but you can also engage in direct dialogues. Now, here's where I show you how to use my visualization and my meditation for making contact. I put you in a trance. I show you how to do this. And then I show you how to talk directly back and forth without the human and you know animal open vessels, without the earthly prop, without any of that. We talk directly. And the purpose of the direct dialoguing is multi-tiered. If you need to say goodbye to someone who was ripped from you due to sudden accidental death or illness, if you want to get support as you travel down the bumpy road called life to assist you in obtaining guidance or to fulfill your spiritual development and your ultimate destiny. destiny. But now what if you're one of the millions of people who harbors some unfinished business with someone in spirit. Well, now we're going to dialogue directly in order to heal that unfinished business. So I show you how to do it back and forth in writing, using a tape recorder. Now, here's the thing, Sandra, I want everybody to get, and this is so wonderful, as I discovered, often we have to wait until someone has left his or her body in order to work it out. Why? Because in spirit form, they're more evolved. In spirit form, Just as they leave their bodies, they receive a life review that helps them see how they have messed up with us. Mm -hmm. And this life review primes them for being ready now to work it out with us where they couldn't have worked it out when they were in a body. Now, how did I discover that they see what they didn't see? It was literally the first week after Jean left his body and I went to do the car thing and introduce myself there because Jean did the car thing and they didn't know me. I say to Debbie, who introduces herself to me, Jean just left his body, and she says, I'm a widow too. With that, her husband in spirit starts beating down my door, saying to me, tell her to stop making the same mistake that I did with our son because now she's creating the same power struggle. Well, I'm blown away. She burst into tears and she says, it's true, I am doing this. But what was most significant for me was her husband only knew the mistake when he left his body. Okay? So that's why one of my patients said to me, I wish my mother would hurry up and die so we can work this out. (laughs) It's no. Oh, I I get it though. I do. I mean, you don't wish that, but. But it's no joke. Now, here's one other piece that is so uplifting. They need our help in order to help them evolve spiritually. And part of the help that we can give them, and it's also a gift that we give to ourselves, is to work out our unfinished business. Now, how do I know this? It was the first Good Friday, and Jean sent me to the bird lady, Lainey. I didn't know her personally, but she had helped us try to save our little canary, Fluffy, and it was unsuccessful. And I went in, and as soon as I walked in, She points out a little Gouldian finch that is looking very bad. And she says, by nightfall, this little bird is going to be dead. She said, if we don't do something, it's going to be dead. It hasn't eaten in two days. It's too small to survive another night without food. So I said, may I try to help the bird? She said, okay. I go to the cage and I press my cheek to the bars. Now, normally a bird would freak out. Uh And this bird doesn't freak. Now I begin to speak to the bird out loud. Now I am energetically communicating with this bird in the same way that we energetically communicate with spirit. I'm talking out loud just so Lainey can hear me. And I say to the bird, I want you to go down to your seed bowl and I want you to eat right away. The bird instantly obeys me. He starts to eat. The more the bird eats, he's scarfing up seeds like a little vacuum. He's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. With that, he's now chirping and flitting around. At this point, I become aware that there is an energy presence around the bird 
And this bur- this energy sounds like a woman. I think it's Lainey's mother, but I don't know who's in spirit. The mother says, I'm sorry I was such a weakling and I didn't protect you from him. With that, I look at Lainey. She bursts into tears and she says, that's my mom. My mom always called herself a weakling. Hmm. Now I look back at the bird and the bird is starting to look sick. He's craning his neck upwards and he's not eating again. And I'm aware now that the other spirit presence is making this bird ill. So I say to the bird, don't worry, I'll help Lainey with this other spirit. Go back to eating. The bird does. (laughs) Now I'm aware that this other presence is a man. Feels like her father. He says, I know that you're still afraid of me because I sexually molested you. But I am telling you, I can't harm you now. And more importantly, you need to heal this by confronting me. And I need to be confronted so that I can evolve spiritually. I can't evolve without you confronting me. And you must confront me so that you grow and stop being afraid and a frightened, you know, little wounded victim. I say this to her and she says, I am still afraid of my father. I am still scared. We dialogue back and forth and she arrives at peace with him. Fantastic. It's so fantastic. Now, here's the neatest part of all. Sandra, I know you know this. Our only purpose on the earth plane is to perfect our ability to love ourselves and others. This life is what I call our love lab. Hmm. But the problem is it's very hard to love others if we don't fully love ourselves. I am living proof of the challenge. How do you love yourself when you were raised in a crazy, abusive family? I tell the story in part one of Love Never Dies. I was beaten physically. I was beaten verbally. And the problem was that I continued to hear my parents' mean voices putting me down in my head Mm -hmm. long after I left home. Sure. And even though I was with Jean for almost 30 years and he surrounded me in love, I still had those voices in my head. They tore me down no matter how successful I was. I didn't love myself. My confidence wasn't where it needed to be. After Jean left his body, I went to my professional group in the city and I was weeping and I said, I can't get these voices to stop tearing me down and destroying my calm. All the shrinks in the group delivered the traditional party line. Just yell louder, tell them to shut the F up, (laughs) have our voices, replace their voices. This never worked for me, never worked for my patients. It doesn't work. No. I came home, I collapse on my knees and I say to Jean, I am begging you, please help me. And suddenly, Sandra, he appears to me as the embodiment of love. He takes my face in his hands. He surrounds me in this golden light that is also surrounding him. He turns me toward him and the light. And he says to me, Jamie, listen, listen, listen to me. Let my love for you fully enter you. And in that moment, I was healed. And I realized then why I needed to wait until Jean left his body to be fully healed. Because once they are freed from the physical vessel, their love for us can enter us unimpeded in a way it couldn't do when they were trapped in a physical vessel. I had to wait until Jean left his body to be fully healed. So ultimately, connecting with your loved ones in spirit is your fast track to self-love. So once you reconnect, Open your door of your heart and allow them to heal all your unfinished business. Heal every corner of your mind, body, spirit, soul, emotions. Now you become a well that is overflowing with love that you can share with the world. And that is love never dies. That's beautiful. And our time goes by so fast. I'm like, how can it go by so fast? Can you give us some tips there are something if you were to give one exercise or one something that we can do today and I have no doubt um, that I'll be reading your book real soon and others will as well but just something that you can give us to start to give us a jump start to either connect or something with grief or something what would okay what would you tell us to do the first thing that you can do and then actually uh, we can even do this together. We only have a couple of minutes, right? Mm-hmm. Well, we get, yeah, right. we got about five minutes or so. All right. So, well, what you what you do is you sit down, you close your eyes. This is called my visualization. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this visualization puts us into the superconscious mind. 
we have to be in a trance. By being in a trance, we raise our vibrational rate so that we're more able to match spirit energy vibrational rate, and then we're more easily able to send and receive. So do you think we could do this together? Uh, yeah, let's. I mean, I don't have to hang this up. So all right, you so let's take your time and then we'll complete right. it when we complete it. Thank All you, right, so, by the way. Okay. So close your eyes and take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. A second breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And a third in through your nose and out through your mouth. And on the next inhalation, I want you to feel the warm golden light of spirit entering through your crown chakra, the energy center at the top of your head. And as you exhale, I want you to feel that warm golden light washing down over your body and feel it having the power to penetrate your blood, your organs, and your cells, trading any tension for the golden light. And the golden light now washes over your forehead and your face and your jaw, down your throat and your neck. And down your chest and your upper back. And down your arms and out your fingers. We flush out the tension. And keep breathing and putting that golden light into your stomach and your mid back. And the tension's dropping down as the golden light washes over your groin and your low back. And down the front of your legs and the back of your legs. And down your knees, shins, calves, ankles, feet, and toes. And if you sense any area of the body resisting the flow, just let your inhaling breath Bring the golden light into that area and flush out the tension. And now feel that light melting your muscles to taffy, melting in a summer sun. And you're sinking deeper and deeper as if you're in an elevator, dropping lower and lower into the elevator shaft or in a well bucket, dropping lower and lower. And when you do this at home, you'll take as much time as you need to feel fully relaxed. And when you're relaxed, then we move into the meditation for making contact, followed by the dialoguing with the departed, which I, obviously we don't have the time to do all of that now, but this is your preface. I think I lost her there. No, you didn't. (laughs) 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 I was just soaking it up. And you know what I'm thinking is I took a course in mediumship in May at the world famous Arthur Finley College in the UK. And the biggest thing they said you must do, even if it's just five or 10 minutes today, uh, to eight per day, um, is to connect like this. And it was just imagining a golden light. I mean, it's just, Uh it's perfect, but really getting that it's connecting to the source and letting, and that almost as if when you plug in your cell phone and you can see it charging, 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 and then you fully get a charge doing this charges us, puts us in alignment energetically and yep. as far now you're as open. being a yeah. training for a medium, I mean, you need that strength or whatever you want to call it, um, the battery full charge to be able to um, right. more effectively and you, receive these. And you don't need to be, you don't even need to go to a medium because people pe- people call me on Hey Ask Radio, as I said, and they st- by the end of the call, they're already dialoguing. And then when we do the four hour, you know, live and virtual retreat, they start unable to send and receive it all. By the end, they're doing it. Now, then they go a step farther and do the Love Never Dies online course, which you self study over eight weeks, you're in the deep end. And then if you really want to take it farther, I now certify coaches. <laughs> oh, and I, 
And they now are just spreading our message and our healing farther and wider. So, you know, you can do this to whatever level you wish. And by the way, I want everybody to know the audio book is now available as of this week. And it doesn't cost anything. If you go to Amazon.com and you take a free Audible trial membership, you can receive my book for free. That's great news. Could you also mention um, your meditations? I saw that. On yes, your uh, website, and it's yes. only a few dollars. And just before I hit yes. buy, I thought, "Oh, it's time for me to call you." But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love how you just started this, and I, you know, we could have gone on for an hour, um, me listening to you. So, could you just mention what what that is? Your yeah. Meditations? So at askdoctorlove dot com under the store, I have recorded the Love Never Dies meditations in my own voice. So you'll find that under the store drop down. That's where also the Love Never Dies online course is. And the audio book is also in my voice as well because I seem to knock, I knock people unconscious. And by the way, <laughs> in a good way. My, yeah, right. My mailing list. If you sign up for the mailing list, there's a free gift for you to just get you started because a lot of people still like to read, you know, a hard copy of a book. So you'll receive the preface and the intro of Love Never Dies. And a lot of people like that because they get started on the journey while they're waiting for the book to arrive. Mm, all good. And on those meditations, does that help you connect as well? Sure. Okay. Because it's every meditation, but you know, I don't want you to just do the meditational exercises. Use it as a companion for the book because you, there's a lot of work that we have to do to eliminate any false beliefs. There are exercises in creating a greater state of receptivity, recognizing the signs, learning how to dialogue. And also in part three of Love Never Dies, I give you lots of case examples of people dialoguing and healing you know, their unfinished business, whether they've been physically, emotionally, or sexually molested. So many of us have been. So reading other people's stories helps. Makes a huge a difference. Lot. I have and, one last question and then, before we And then the go. online course, too, helps so much because okay. then you're watching people heal, you know. Yeah, yeah. and it makes yeah. a difference. I know there's people I've talked to that have been stuck in grief for 30 years. And if you can Doesn't move matter, yeah. somebody through... Because life is about living and loving and loving yourself and forgiving and sharing and serving and so many things. But my last question is, your husband, first of all, seems extraordinary. And right. my my mind's saying, yeah, well, it's happening for her because he was so spiritually advanced. Right, 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 um, right. Can all of our loved ones come through uh, strong? Not, or, or not is it only can they they do. They so do. here's okay. the thing. Love is the current of connection. So, okay, if you had a troubled relationship, you can still connect. But if you love someone, you have to do your homework on your side. I'm very open to the spirit realm. I explain why in part one of Love Never Dies. I had some unusual things that made me more open. That doesn't mean you can't become open, which is why in part three of Love Never Dies, I teach you how to tune to the spirit channel of your brain. Mm. You've got to be more open and more receptive. That helps your loved ones come through. They all come through. When we when we do the Hay House radio show, people will say, oh, it's been 30 years. I never got a sign. By, by the time we're done with the phone call, they're already communicating. So they're sending us signs and communications all the time. We just don't recognize because we're not receptive enough. Mm, I want to ask so you that, to remind yeah. us how we can find your Hay House radio show. It's every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Yeah, noon Eastern. Noon so Eastern. just... HayHouseRadio.com, love never dies. But you can find everything that you want to know at AskDrLove.com. I love you, Dr. Love. <laughs> You're so great. It was so great spending oh, thank time you. with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for all you do, all you continue to do, and that all you share and that all you give, because I do know you're a giver. And for oh, our yeah. listener today, thank you for spending the time with us. This has been fun. And just to know, even if you haven't experienced it yourself, it's possible, and there are tools to get there. And I believe with all my heart that we are souls having a human experience. So it is a no-brainer that we can connect with a soul who's no longer having a human experience, who is in the hereafter. And as Dr. Jamie said, you know, heaven is all around us. It literally is right here, 
just after. So in closing, I want to say, uh, don't forget to visit we don't die radio.com, which is the home base for all the episodes. And I have all the links that uh, Dr. Love has mentioned on this website. I mean, on this episode, to her books, to her radio show and her videos and just everything. Um, we don't die radio.com and click on episode 120. So in closing, This is Sandra Champlain. I have been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So love is the currency of connection. So go love yourself. Go love others. Look for the signs. uh, Enjoy Dr. Love's book. And thank you for listening. And we'll see you soon. (music) 